Hello? Hi. So we have a much more intimate gathering than we'd anticipated, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, this is the fourth uh, Schiller Institute presentation that we've conducted in Ottawa, uh, the first one having begun in June of this year. Um, the purpose of these is to really give a, a fresh perspective to global developments. Uh, since our organization is not new, it's been around for many decades, um, the theme of this particular conference uh, is will the West join the BRICS or collapse with Wall Street and go to war? This is a, some might call this a, a somewhat uh, rhetorical title, but yet this is a very serious issue. And Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, the economist, the statesman whom you know we work with, um, has been explaining for many, many uh, decades uh, through his international network of collaborators that you could not understand geopolitics, uh, different aspects of warfare as they're thought through uh, top down without understanding the political, physical, economic conditions driving this process. And we're coming into a point uh, in history right now which is very ripe for change. We all see this um, up until not that long ago. There was still a perception that there was a certain immutability in the global financial order as we had known it for uh, many years leading up to the 2008-2009 crisis. And really, in, until this, some developments that have happened even more recently, people have still treated the 2008-2009 crisis as something in time that happened years ago, and now we're in something new. But with the, uh, the recent developments, I'd say especially centering around the Eurozone, uh, beginning first with the uh, departure of the Swiss franc, the, you know, the deconnection of the, of the Swiss franc from the Euro, immediately uh, afterwards we had seen the announcement of the next Euro bailout, by the ECB of upwards of a trillion dollars. Um, and then peaking with the recent elections in Greece, uh, we're seeing that a lot of these beliefs in the hegemony and the immutability of the, or the financial order are very questionable indeed. And this is the first time now that we have really recognized a party coming to power which has called out the fallacy underlying the derivative debt obligations being imposed upon uh, governments and saying that we need to reorganize according to the 1953 debt renegotiation that was conducted after World War II. Uh, of course, Germany was not able to pay its debts. Nobody wanted a repeat of the Versailles Treaty of 15, 20 years earlier, which saw Germany go into a hyperinflationary uh, collapse, which essentially created conditions that fascism was able to take advantage of later on and saw Hitler come to power. So nobody wanted that to happen after World War II. Thus, there was a write-down and a renegotiation of the debts uh, of Germany, which allowed for the Marshall Plan to be uh, brought in as a, as a great success. The parameters of economic principles and planning then are not what we see today being conceptualized when we're discussing debt, debt negotiation because primarily of the uh, hyper-inflated uh, and hyper-complexified derivative uh, system, which is created a condition where people don't even want to discuss a haircut in debts for many countries because of the associated leverage and all sorts of uh, you know, institutions that could collapse even if you chop a little bit off. So this has created a condition which Mr. LaRouche and, and Mr. Speed here will soon discuss is at the heart of a policy orientation taking us towards uh, conflicts which, as Mikhail Gorbachev recently announced in a, in a January 9th interview, uh, could lead to a thermonuclear war if tempers are not brought in. This, of course, has a lot of reference to what's going on in Ukraine and certain uh, manipulations of that environment uh, that we know about. So there, to recap, we have a system which is ending and a system which will take its place. What it will look like is yet to be seen. Many people, many policymakers, well, the citizens, I could say, don't generally understand that there exists something called the New Silk Road uh, program in Eurasia. They're, most citizens are not familiar with this. Most policymakers that we interact with, if they know about it, especially in Canada, don't understand what it is. They understand that there are rail developments, there are new credit mechanisms that have been created since especially uh, this summer in Fort Letts, Brazil, which saw the creation of the new development bank by the BRICS which saw soon afterwards the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the uh, announcement for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Bank, and a series of other measures like the New Silk Road Fund. 
with, but they, they may know of some of these in a formal standpoint, but they don't understand what this actually is in its essence. And they don't know that Russia and China have both offered Canada on several occasions the opportunity to join the New Silk Road through the Bering Strait Rail Corridor, which was made Russian policy openly in October of 2007. And Chinese policy, and I mean, this is the Chinese government had endorsed the proposal in May of 2014. Most policymakers don't know that these offers are even on the table for us to join. So it's not that you have an, ex an exclusive orientation towards a BRICS empire or something like that, which some people have got in their minds. But you actually have a very open, inclusive outlook, which people like Xi Jinping, even Putin, and many others uh, have said they welcome the West to join. They welcome Greece to work with them through other all sorts of physical economic endeavors. Um, Mr. Speed has been working as a representative uh, for Mr. Lyndon LaRouche for many decades, for a representative of the Executive Intelligence Review magazine, which uh, you've all received copies of, which has been published by our organization for 40 years as a weekly. Uh, the Schiller Institute as well has been representing internationally. And uh, Mr. Speed will be going into some of what is not being discussed uh, in polite society. And uh, I'll leave the floor to Mr. Speed. Just so you know, um, after he gives a presentation, we're going to open up for Q&A. The Q&A component of this day, today's briefing will not be recorded. Uh, so we'll, they'll just open up a, a more open discussion. So I'll leave it at that. I always set my timer so I make sure that I don't go on and bore people. Uh, we've been holding conferences internationally to uh, promote and make people aware of this report, which has just come out uh, at the end of last year. The New Silk Road becomes the world land bridge. It is a successor report to a report that we wrote in January of 1997. Uh, and that report was called The New Silk Road, the Eurasian Land Bridge, Locomotive for World Economic Development. Um, what I want to first state is that the proposal of New Silk Road is our proposal. Uh, it was originated by our organization, and specifically by Lyndon and Helga LaRouche in 1993, and was discussed in China at that time. Um, it took three years to organize a conference, which occurred in June of 1996, involving 37 nations in Shanghai. Also, portions of the conference happened in Beijing. Uh, Helga LaRouche attended that conference and gave a keynote presentation, one of the keynote presentations at that conference at that time. And the proposals which you can see when you are able to uh, purchase or otherwise acquire the report, on the back of the report are an updated version of proposals that we uh, outlined then. Uh, and also we included those that have been done. Most of the proposals we made at that time actually, or many of them at least, have been uh, completed. Uh, what is relevant about, uh, in specific, it was not that we completely solely originated anything. I am not I don't mean to say that. There were three branches of the Silk Road policy in 1997, two of which had originated with both the Russian and Chinese governments. The third arm of that proposal, which was uh, to extend the road into Southeast Asia, uh, was recently adopted by President Xi Jinping in uh, his uh, discussions in uh, Indonesia in October, actually, of uh, 2013. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to simply first indicate something about what it is or why it is that we did what we did. Uh, I'm not going to give a history. Uh, as I said, I want to keep it short and keep us to questions. You have received uh, our uh, recent copy of Executive Intelligence Review magazine, uh, The Hamilton Principle Revived in New York City. It, it begins with an article by myself uh, and essentially sort of 
gives a characterization of a conference that we held on the occasion of the Martin Luther King weekend in uh, New York. Uh, Helga LaRouche, uh, the founder of the Schiller Institute, uh, spoke there. Um, she's the one that is the most uh, associated with our World Land Bridge policy, and she was, as I say, the keynote speaker back in 1996. Uh, she has been called or termed the Silk Road Lady because of her extensive discussions with the Chinese, uh, including Chinese governmental circles, over the years. And uh, the importance of saying all this is to first contextualize the other remarks I'm here to make. Um, sometimes, because of the way in which Executive Intelligence Review and Mr. Lyndon LaRouche have interacted with uh, governments, uh, particularly the American government, the United States government, particularly since 1981, at which point LaRouche was a, a negotiator uh, an off-the-record back-channel negotiator with the then Soviet Union on behalf of the Reagan administration and its National Security Council. Uh, as a result of that and related uh, circumstances, sometimes we get what are called walk-ins. Uh, and uh, about now, almost two years ago, uh, we received such a walk-in in New York, and it was from a man, uh, he'll be called Victor, and, uh, and I uh, had a discussion with him, a meeting with him, uh, and he made me to understand that he had a certain relationship with the Russian government that he uh, wished me to understand had caused him to be in the United States for 30 years and act as a briefer, back channel briefer, on questions of nuclear policy. And that the Russians were particularly alarmed because uh, they found that it became, had become increasingly difficult to convey uh, the urgency of their sense of anxiety about American policy. Uh, subsequent to that uh, discussion, there have been several persons that have talked about this, and I'm going to reference this quickly, and I'm referencing it after the remarks I made initially because my intent is not to uh, be alarmist about this. It, my intent is to make sure that people are updated as to what others are actually saying, what's actually out there right now. Um, so it, there are a couple of particular uh, things I'd like to call to your attention. Uh, December of last year now, December of 2014, uh, Press TV re reported the uh, release of a statement by 120 international leaders warning of a new danger of thermonuclear conflict. I just want to first indicate some of the people that signed this. John McCole, former NATO Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. David Richards, ex-chief of, of the British Defense Staff. American General James Cartwright, former Vice Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Their, their statement said, among other things, quote, we believe the risks posed by nuclear weapons and the international dynamics that could lead to nuclear weapons being used are underestimated or insufficiently understood by world leaders. And it got, went on to talk about conflict hotspots. I'm not, as I say, going to go into details. We can discuss any of this if you wish in the questions and answers. Uh, Matthew alluded to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's remarks. Uh, these have happened now on several occasions. Uh, uh, he began uh, being quoted on this uh, back in November of uh, last year. And uh, on January 29th, he made the following uh, statement. Uh, he said, this was in an Interfax news agency uh, interview. He said, quote, plainly speaking, the United States has already dragged us into a new Cold War, trying to openly implement its idea of triumphalism. What's next? Unfortunately, I cannot be sure that the Cold War will not bring about a hot one. I'm afraid they might take that risk. Um, and it went on. There was all, now, that was that interview. Uh, there was also a Russian, an RT broadcast interview 
in which he stated, uh, quote, all we, hear, all we hear from the United States and the European Union now is sanctions against Russia. Are they completely out of their minds? The US has been totally lost in the jungle and is dragging us in there as well. Uh, now, there have been various comments in the uh, American press. Uh, one of the ones that's more interesting, because it alludes to something different, which I want to reference, is an individual by the name of Stephen Starr, I believe. Uh, let's see if I have his, his oh yes. Senior, senior scientist for the Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, director of the Clinical Laboratory Science Program at the University of Missouri. Now what he's talking about is what he calls the lethality of nuclear war, and, and he, somewhat like my friend Victor, uh, expressed his concern, and it was this. He said, on two occasions, in 2010 and then in April of last year, April 20th, 2014, he said that he wanted, he, he, he had a discussion with uh, various high level uh, American negotiators from the, for, uh, on the START Treaty, for example, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Rose Galtamoller. And uh, he's referring here to uh, U.S. officials that were sent to brief representatives of the NGOs at the Non Proliferation Treaty preparatory meeting at the UN. Here's what he said. He said, are you gentlemen aware that if 1% of the nuclear arsenals of either Russia or the United States were used, that that would be sufficient to create the conditions of a global thermonuclear winter? And if that occurred, it would wipe out large amounts of life on Earth or would lead to a famine that would do the same for two to three billion people. He said he was alarmed that in each case, uh, the people that he talked to said they were not aware of that. Now, while that may seem, again, to not be a related point, here's what the problem is. In the recent uh, days, meaning in the last period of the last several months, uh, the Obama administration, in particular the case of Ukraine, has clearly operated from the standpoint of extending NATO to the Russian border. As some are familiar, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, one of the major worries at the time was that there were 300,000 Russian and Warsaw Pact troops deployed in Germany. And those troops were uh, withdrawn on the premise that NATO would not be extended to the Russian border. That has now occurred. Uh, the additional problem is that, as some of you may know, uh, back in 2006, there was a, a, a document in Foreign Affairs uh, article called The Rise of U.S. Nuclear Primacy. Uh, this was written uh, by Kyra Lieber and Daryl G. Press, you can take a look in, in, uh, for this if you're interested, in which they said the following, and I think it's important because this is now the operational doctrine of the United States Strategic Rocket Forces. They said, during the Cold War, many scholars and policy analysts believed that mutual and assured destruction made the world relatively stable and peaceful because it induced great caution in international politics. Calls on some other things. Critics of MAD, however, argued that it prevented not great power war, but the rolling back of the power and influence of a dangerously expansionist and totalitarian Soviet Union. The debate around mutual unassured destruction may now seem like ancient history, but it is actually more relevant now than ever because the age of MAD is nearing an end. Today, for the first time in almost 50 years, the United States stands on the verge of attaining nuclear primacy. It will probably soon be possible for the United States to destroy the long-range nuclear arsenals of Russia or China with a first strike. 
This dramatic shift in the nuclear balance of power stems from a series of improvements in the United States nuclear systems, the precipitous decline of Russia's arsenal, and the glacial pace of modernization of China's nuclear forces. Unless Washington's policies change, or Moscow and Beijing take steps to increase the size and readiness of their forces, Russia and China and the rest of the world will live in the shadow of U.S. nuclear primacy for many years to come. All right, now we will come to the point of this report. This report is not written from the standpoint of, oh my God, we're about to have nuclear war and we hope that we can stop it and we'd like to talk about good things that are happening. There's a very specific set of discussions that happened between Putin and Xi Jinping during uh, last year, and particularly in May, when the natural gas, uh, the 30-year, $400 billion 400 billion 30-year proposal on the national ga natural gas collaboration was signed. One part of the communique that was announced stated this between the two leaders at that time, quote, increasing the effectiveness of collaboration in high technology areas, priority projects in the international use of, nu of nuclear energy, civil aviation, and a program of cooperation in basic research on space flight, satellite, satellite observation of the Earth, satellite navigation, and research into deep space and manned space travel. Um, and it goes on to talk about this as being a major area of collaboration between the two nations. Uh, that further militarization of space should be prevented, um, and that the uh, unilateral stationing of defense installations was the destabilizing process. Now, I don't know how aware you may or may not be of the Chinese uh, lunar program proposals. They are very well known in the United States. Uh, they center around what the United States lunar program used to center around. And that is the mining of the substance helium-3 on the moon. In the days of the early NASA program, scientists such as the German Kraft Erika and others in their discussions of the original lunar program, always vectored that program, not from the standpoint of having a man land on the moon for the purpose of creating headlines in the newspapers about the greatness of human achievement. No, the purpose was, from that time, the industrialization of the moon, and specifically the mining of helium-3. Now, this is a significant, of significance for our discussion today and is the essential point, really, I want to make about our discussion because from the time of Dwight Eisenhower, the American nuclear program has never been, from that time, a nuclear fission program. The American nuclear program was a nuclear, thermonuclear, that is, fusion program. And when Dwight Eisenhower spoke about what he termed atoms for peace, his notion was that the danger was that for the first time in American history, the American military would become a permanent installation. That is, after every other war in American history, the military forces had always been decommissioned and demobilized. But because of the creation of nuclear weapons, there was now what of course, famously referred to as the military-industrial complex. So what Eisenhower moved to do was to create what he called atoms for peace. At that time, of course, it was largely things like the Operation Plowshare program, the use of peaceful nuclear explosives, and that kind of thing. But what in fact occurred during the period of the 60s and the 70s, and, and Kennedy's space program had elements of this, uh, for example, for those of you who may remember the nuclear rocket program of Kennedy. Uh, this is one of these uh, L areas which is, which is not well known, but anyone who has thought seriously about the idea of deep space travel, such as a mission to Mars, knows that that's not going to be done with chemical rockets. It's going to be done with nuclear rockets. 
And this was all integrated at the time into the Kennedy Space Program of that period. The Chinese space program is for the purpose of mining helium-3 on the moon. This is considered by certain forces in the United States to be a causus belli, cause of war. This will not be discussed, and you will not find it publicly discussed. Well, what has been going on, and this has been sort of a, if you will, I won't call it a secret war merely, but there's been a conflict uh, that uh, is unacknowledged, and it has to do with the control of the energy resources of the future. Um, unfortunately, there have been many things said about this which have been disinformational for many years, but uh, our uh, forces, our organization, the Executive Intelligence Review, for some of you may know this, some of you may not, but uh, Lyndon LaRouche in specific founded EIR back in January of 1974. In that same year uh, was the founder of what was called the Fusion Energy Foundation. It was a uh, group of scientists and uh, people who were interested in science who were promoting thermonuclear fusion energy. In April of 1975, LaRouche wrote a proposal called How the International Development Bank Would Work. And if you look at uh, Xi Jinping's Asian Inf uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment Fund, which was announced uh, first in October of 2013, you'll find striking parallels uh, between the LaRouche International Development Bank proposal and that proposal. Now, of course, that was a much earlier proposal, 40 years ago. But there's one uh, component, part, I'd like to tell you about from that 40-year-ago proposal, and I'd like to say something to you about the occasion for the release of that proposal. In that proposal, on page 20 of that proposal, Mr. LaRouche talks about what he calls CTR, or Controlled Thermonuclear Reactions. And the specific conception he lays out there is Given the processes of imperial looting of Africa, Asia, and South America over many decades, many people have talked about how these countries would ever somehow catch up to the West. And he proposes there that there is no way for those countries to catch up to the West by means of monetary compensation, by means of a loan system to those countries. It's not a matter of giving people loans or grants and trying to somehow integrate them into a certain rate of development uh, which will be combined and uneven relative to uh, the advanced sectors. Rather, what must be done is to implement a policy of uh, a crash program to establish commercially viable controlled thermonuclear reactions as the premise and basis of energy throughput and energy usage worldwide. Now, this was not a some kind of pie-in-the-sky proposal. This came out of the discussions that we were having with American scientists who were already doing these things in 1974. And the Russians were doing things uh, in the same area. They were more advanced in the United, than the United States at that time with laser, uh, laser focus in particular, and their notion and their ideas about the actual uh, physical geometry and physical principles involved. This came about because of their mastery of uh, the work of Vladimir Vernadsky, the great Russian scientist and uh, biogeochemist, uh, who, whose work had become integrated uh, from the standpoint of its, its fundamental theoretical, theoretical underpinnings into the, uh, the nuclear doctrines of Marshall Sokolovsky. Uh, Kennedy was aware of this in 62, and one of the reasons that in June of 63, at American University, he was proposing joint Russian-American collaboration in space was because Kennedy was aware that the Russians, while they were not able to build uh, uh, laser-based defense weapons or anything like that, were more theoretically advanced than the United States. That, that advancement level, uh, that, that superiority uh, continued into the late 70s. Um, uh, but, but changed in the 1980s. In any case, LaRouche was, on behalf of the Reagan administration, uh, a back-channel negotiator with the Russians on what, was, what later became known as Star Wars, but was called by Reagan the Strategic Defense Initiative. If you look in Russian literature of the last three or four years, you will see something called the SDE, 
the strategic defense of the earth. Now this is a set of proposals that have been advanced by the Putin administration to the United States as a way of attempting to return to the earlier discussions that LaRouche had initiated during the period of 1981 to 83 with the Russians, which were then rejected by the Russians at that time. Uh, elements of the Russian establishment at that time were in severe disagreement uh, with the idea of the Soviets then trusting the United States uh, on any of these matters, and those negotiations ended about two months prior to President Reagan then announcing the policy which caught the Russians unaware. What was not also clear and should be made clear here was that that policy at that time was not American policy, that was Ronald Reagan's policy. It was not the policy of James Baker, who was Secretary of State, it was not the policy, that's just my timer, of Caspar uh, Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense. It was an initiative taken by Reagan and Reagan singularly, together with his National Security Council members, Judge William Clark and a few people in that, that sector. The Bush forces were vehemently opposed to this and are vehemently opposed to this to this day. The Bush policy is the policy that you all became familiar with during the period of the 1988 through 92 administration in which, remember, Dick Cheney was Secretary of Defense um, and the Iraq War, the first Iraq War occurred, uh, which was uh, uh, preceded, of course, by the war in Panama. It's something not to be under, uh, underestimated. But I mention this because uh, the, on, on May 20th, of, uh, May 5th, rather, I'm just going to be the 20th of May of 1990, uh, there was a meeting that happened uh, at the White House involving Cheney uh, and uh, uh, Colin Powell and uh, Lewis Libby and Wolfowitz, and uh, this was the, the, the so-called the 520 committee discussions. Uh, it was from these discussions that the present, still present policy of the United States administration was first shaped, and that was that in the aftermath of the fall of the wall, would the United States pursue a policy of take dismantling of NATO? And a, re, and a sort of a pullback from Europe, or would there be, if you will, for lack of a better historical analogy, a kind of Delian League policy? If those of you are familiar with the uh, post-Greek, uh, post-Salamis, Battle of Salamis policy of uh, Athens in the forming of the naval alliance called the Delian League, which, uh, because of the way in which it was used for purposes of attempting to dominate the Aegean and the various Greek city-states essentially created the conditions of the Peloponnesian War. Yes, at the time the Athenians believed that this was going to create a great empire for them, and they did pursue that outlook. And they destroyed themselves uh, through that process, and, and uh, essentially Greece never recovered from that process. Hopefully the new government that's come in which has some policies and has some members with whom we're familiar, will have better luck. Uh, but I'm saying this because the present American policy is suicidal, destructive, and is delusional. Uh, it's significant to say that and to try to now unpack that from the standpoint of that not merely being epithets. Uh, Mr. Uh, Starr, references one thing with respect to the, uh, the Obama administration. Just want to reference this for a moment because it may... He says this. Again, remember, he is the physician for social responsibility. He just says, it is frightening that President Obama and his administration appear unaware that the world's leading scientists have for years predicted that a nuclear war fought with the United States and or Russian strategic nuclear arsenal means the end of human history. Do they not know of the existential threat these arsenals pose to the human race, or do they choose to remain silent because this fact doesn't fit into their official narratives? We hear only about terrorist threats that could destroy a city with an atomic bomb, while the threat of human extinction from nuclear war is never mentioned, even when the United States and Russia are each running huge nuclear war games in preparation for a U.S.-Russian war. I have a, 
a friend by the name of Ann Lee. I think some of you may have heard of her. She wrote the book, uh, What the U.S. Can, use from, can Learn from China. It's a well-known uh, professor at NYU. She spoke at one of our conferences in December. And at that time, what she stated was that friends of hers at the War College, United States War College, uh, had expressed alarm because they, um, they noted that whenever the Chinese delegations would visit, they were always taken into uh, and had discussions with Americans about war games that they had conducted and were conducting with, with China. Uh, and, and these always were of a nuclear variety. Uh, importantly, with respect to the foreign affairs doctrine, uh, uh, doc, uh, foreign affairs uh, article that I started stated before, what has happened is the following. Uh, there is an idea, uh, sort of the same sort of idea. It's, it's an idea which utopians like the earlier general, Curtis LeMay, uh, held at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that idea is that there's some way to sneak attack the Russians. Now, Snowden's exposés of cyber warfare are pertinent in this regard because these utopians believe that they are capable, or they have capabilities, that might allow them to knock out sophisticated computer and computer-based electronics that the Russians and others use for their, for, for their guidance systems for nuclear missiles. And that the combinations of those and advanced drone capability would allow you, if you were, for example, in Kiev, to outfit those, uh, uh, those drones with either sort of bunker buster conventional weapons or tactical nuclear devices. And that there could be a way or might be a way to launch such a strike uh, that you could significantly weaken or if not knock out major Russian capability. Now clearly for those of us who were still on, the, on, on, the, on this side of sanity, these things would be, shall we say, uh, unthinkable, except there's a problem. There are no war technologies in history that have not been used. The notion that a continuous refinement of weapons in the tactical nuclear realm would never be used in a conflict is precisely that what will guarantee that they would be used. It is precisely that kind of delusional capability which is now rife in the American establishment and which you see in the case of the Ukraine policy where uh, a coup was made by American and British and related intelligence in Ukraine and installing a cabinet all of whose members speak English as a second language, or third language. Um, and, and yet, uh, at, at the precise time that we come to the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, which has a completely different significance in Russia than it has in the United States, uh, with Ukraine, of course, being in the, form, in the kind of chaos it's in presently, that, that it, it, there's no sensitivity to the idea that the combination of sanctions on Russia and promotion of and defense of that present government in Ukraine uh, can figure in the strategic military assessments and judgments of Russian military officials. That's kind of stupid, but that's nonetheless the way it is. Now, the significance of this proposal is the following. The Russians have proposed to the United States, have attempted to engage the United States in something called strategic defense of the Earth. The United States refuses to so engage, and the Obama administration, in its takedown of NASA in particular, and its lunar programs in particular, in specific, uh, shows no inclination to admit the degrees to which their own use of both cyber cybernetics and other means and satellites are intended for war fighting, including using space-based technologies for that purpose. So they don't want to admit it. So the problem that you have presently to be solved, and it can be solved, is that there has to be, be a, a notification of the American population and of other populations that these proposals exist the Silk Road proposal exists that the United States could join the 
Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa in a joint collaboration for economic and infrastructural development, and that there is a military strategic proposal also on the table called the Strategic Defense of the Earth, coming from particularly Russia, but in specific that the Chinese lunar program's commitment uh, for the mining of helium-3 provides another basis for the United States to enter into a joint cooperative venture. Uh, this does not require war fighting, of course. Matter of fact, it, it militates against it. But it would mean the end of the pursuit of the forms of imperial policy, uh, which are characteristic of the NATO deployments, forward-based deployments, uh, and diplomatic uh, uh, advancing, advancements of the, of the same type. Uh, now, as an American, I, I, don't, I don't look at this policy, if you will, as an American policy. I see it as an Anglo-American policy. You're probably familiar with LaRouche and what he said about these things over time, so I won't take a lot of time on that. The purposes of, of this forum and, and, and otherwise of the forums that we're trying to do in other parts of the globe now is to unpack uh, this, this initiative, let people know uh, what's really involved and why there's real hope for it, but at the same time make the point that there's a kind of clock ticking uh, and that the present circumstances, uh, particularly in the financial field, uh, are such that we could see something along the lines of the detonation that we saw in 2007 and 2008. Were that to occur, uh, uh, the instabilities that would be in, in, in evidence as a result might lead easily to, to strategic miscalculation. And with that strategic miscalculation, possibility, even probability, of a thermonuclear exchange not only cannot be ruled out, uh, it has to be assumed as possible and therefore preventable. So that's how we are basically uh, doing what we're doing. I'd like to thank you for listening. And I think the only thing I'd like to say in conclusion is um, anything that I've said, uh, which I can't answer, I, I, I certainly have be happy to answer. If there's something that you need in writing, I can try to provide that. Uh, and I would urge that everybody, if possible, get a copy of this report. Uh, and take a look at it yourself, and um, you can check any of the things that I've asserted here in, in various ways, which uh, may or may not satisfy you, but in any case, it's all documentable. Okay, so I think I'll stop there, Matthew. All right, so uh, I guess for now, uh, brought in is a, is a great success. The parameters of economic principles and planning then are not what we see today being conceptualized when we're discussing debt, debt negotiations because primarily of the uh, hyper-inflated uh, and hyper-complexified derivative uh, system which has created a condition where people don't even want to discuss a haircut in debts for many countries because of the associated leverage and all sorts of uh, you know, institutions that could collapse even if you chop a little bit off. So this is created a condition which Mr. LaRouche and, and Mr. Speed here will soon discuss is at the heart of a policy orientation taking us towards uh, conflicts which, as Mikhail Gorbachev recently announced in a, in a January 9th interview, uh, could lead to a thermonuclear war if tempers are not brought in. This of course has a lot of reference to what's going on in Ukraine and certain uh, manipulations of that environment uh, that we know about. So there, to recap, we have a system which is ending and a system which will take its place. What it will look like is yet to be seen. Many people, many policymakers, well, the citizens, I could say, don't generally understand that there exists something called the New Silk Road uh, program in Eurasia. They're, most citizens are not familiar with this. Most policymakers that we interact with if they know about it, people have still treated the 2008, 2009 crisis as something in time that happened years ago, and now we're in something new. But with the, uh, the recent developments, I'd say especially centering around the Eurozone, uh, beginning first with the uh, departure of the Swiss franc, the, you know, the deconnection of the, of the Swiss franc from the Euro, immediately uh, afterwards we had seen the announcement of the next Euro bailout by the ECB of upwards of a trillion dollars. Um, and then peaking with the recent elections in Greece, uh, we're seeing that 
a lot of these beliefs in the hegemony and the immutability of the, or, the financial order are very questionable indeed. And this is the first time now that we have really recognized a party coming to power which has called out the fallacy underlying the derivative debt obligations being imposed upon uh, governments and saying that we need to reorganize according to the 1953 debt renegotiation that was conducted after World War II. Uh, of course, Germany was not able to pay its debts. Nobody wanted a repeat of the Versailles Treaty of 15, 20 years earlier, which saw Germany go into a hyperinflationary uh, collapse, which essentially created conditions that fascism was able to take advantage of later on and saw Hitler come to power. So nobody wanted that to happen after World War II. Thus, there was a write-down and a renegotiation of the debts uh, of Germany, which allowed for the Marshall Plan to the Intelligence Review magazine, which uh, you've all received copies of, which has been published by our organization for 40 years as a weekly. Uh, the Schiller Institute as well has been representing internationally. And uh, Mr. Speed will be going into some of what is not being discussed uh, in polite society. And uh, I'll leave the floor to Mr. Speed. Just so you know, um, after he gives a presentation, we're going to open up for Q&A. The Q&A component of this day, today's briefing will not be recorded. Uh, so we'll, they'll just open up a, a more open discussion. So I'll leave it at that. I always set my timer so I make sure that I don't go on and bore people. Uh, we've been holding conferences internationally to uh, promote and make people aware of this report, which has just come out uh, at the end of last year. The New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge. It is a successor report to a report that we wrote in January of 1997. Uh, and that report was called The New Silk Road, the Eurasian Land Bridge, Locomotive for World Economic Development. Uh, hello? Hello. Hi. So we have a much more intimate gathering than we'd anticipated, and, and that's perfectly fine. Um, this is the fourth uh, Schiller Institute presentation that we've conducted in Ottawa, uh, the first one having begun in June of this year. Um, the purpose of these is to really give a, a fresh perspective to global developments. Uh, since our organization is not new, it's been around for many decades, um, the theme of this particular conference uh, is will the West join the BRICS or collapse with Wall Street and go to war? This is a, some might call this a, a somewhat uh, rhetorical title, but yet this is a very serious issue. And Mr. Lyndon LaRouche, the economist, the statesman whom you know we work with, um, has been explaining for many, many uh, decades uh, through his international network of collaborators that you could not understand geopolitics, uh, different aspects of warfare as they're thought through uh, top-down without understanding the political, physical, economic conditions driving this process. And we're coming into a point uh, in history right now which is very ripe for change. We all see this um, up until not that long ago. There was still a perception that there was a certain immutability in the global financial order as we had known it for uh, many years, leading up to the 2008-2009 crisis. And really, in, until this, some developments that have happened even more recently, people, especially in Canada, don't understand what it is. They understand that there are rail developments, there are new credit mechanisms that have been created since especially uh, this summer in Fort Letza, Brazil which saw the creation of the new development bank by the BRICS, which saw soon afterwards the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the uh, announcement for the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Bank, and a series of other measures like the New Silk Road Fund. With, but they, they may know of some of these in a formal standpoint, but they don't understand what this actually is in its essence. And they don't know that Russia and China have both offered Canada on several occasions the opportunity to join the New Silk Road through the Bering Strait Rail Corridor, which was made Russian policy openly in October of 2007. And Chinese policy, and I mean, this is the Chinese government had endorsed the proposal in May of 2014, 
Most policymakers don't know that these offers are even on the table for us to join. So it's not that you have an, ex an exclusive orientation towards a BRICS empire or something like that, which some people have got in their minds, but you actually have a very open, inclusive outlook, which people like Xi Jinping, even Putin, and many others uh, have said they welcome the West to join. They welcome Greece to work with them through other all sorts of physical economic endeavors. Um, Mr. Speed has been working as a representative uh, for Mr. Lyndon LaRouche for many decades, for a representative of the executive 